And so, God, we're so grateful for your word here. So grateful that we can know your word, we can have your word in front of us. And so as we come to it, we just pray you would open our hearts and open our minds and our eyes to see wondrous things here out of your word, that you would guide us in this time together. Give us hearts that are quick to listen, quick to uh, obey, and quick to celebrate and rejoice and praise you for the God that you are. We love you, Lord, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're continuing in our One Another sermon series this morning. and We're going to dig into our next command here, which is to serve one another. And so in verse 10, Peter mentions this idea of gifts, gifts that we each receive. And so what are these gifts exactly? Who gets these gifts? What do they include? How do we use them? What do they have to do with serving one another? And what's God's ultimate purpose for giving them to us? And so we're going to go through those questions and unpack those questions as we go through our passage here this morning. And so what are these gifts that Peter is talking about? Well, these are what we commonly call within the church spiritual gifts. These gifts are one of the central ways that God blesses his people to help us serve one another. And so what exactly are these gifts? Well, Peter touches on them briefly here in our two verses, uh, but the Apostle Paul kind of unpacks them further in a couple other passages as well, like 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and Romans 13. And so these passages talk about these uh, certain abilities and ways that God uniquely blesses his people. These gifts include things like prophecy, helping people in practical ways, teaching, encouraging one another, giving, uh, giving, leading, showing mercy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, or just having this exceptional confidence in God's ability, healing and, and working miracles, and discernment, speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. And now, I don't have time to go through each of those gifts today and unpack what each of those gifts are and how we understand each of those gifts from a biblical perspective. That's going to have to be another sermon series, another time, which I would love to dig into. But what I want to focus on today is just what's God's big idea for these gifts as a whole? Like, why does he give us these gifts as a whole? What's the big idea behind all of these? Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul probably gives us the best illustration of God's intention of blessing us with these gifts, why he gives us these gifts. And so he uses the example of a body, a body. He notes that a body consists of many parts, right? You think of it, you got a nose, you got ears, you got a mouth, you know, all of these different body parts, they're all different, but they're all one body. They're all part of one body. They're all part of what makes the body as a whole function and, and work together. And so he says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, and so it is with Christ. And so the church we refer to as the body of Christ. And so the body parts, or, or members as Paul calls them, are people. And they're people gifted in different ways, unique ways to serve the, the whole, to serve the common good. And Paul says that God arranged the members of the body, each one as he chose. He gifts each person as he sovereignly decides for, again, for the common good. And so each member is given these certain gifts and has a role to play in contributing to the functioning of the body as a whole. And any one part, an important thing we have to remember is that, that any one part, any one member, any one person isn't more important than any other part. And so those who have gifts and roles that put them, you know, in the front of the congregation, that doesn't mean they're more important than those who have gifts that are serving behind the scenes. Those who are, you know, mowing the grass for the church, cleaning the church, making meals for the sick, getting the coffee ready on a Sunday morning. Okay? Those aren't less important roles. Those are all important critical roles that we have as the body of Christ. And so Peter, in our passage this morning, verse 11, he kind of breaks the, the gifts into two categories, speaking gifts, those maybe you would say that might be the ones that are kind of more in the front of the congregation, but then also serving gifts, those who are doing things kind of behind the scenes. But whichever gift God in his sovereign wisdom decides to bless you with, both Paul's point and Peter's point in our passages are this, 
that they want you to use your gifts. Use them joyfully and eagerly and using them in God's strength, the strength He provides to serve one another, to find ways to serve each other. And so why does God give us these gifts? I think two, two reasons. One is more of a practical reason, and then there's a second kind of deeper reason that I'm going to come back to uh, towards the end. But Paul says kind of the practical reason, as I've said here, is for building up the church. It's for the common good, for us to serve one another. God gives every single person who places their faith in Jesus one or more of these spiritual gifts that empower them beyond their own natural abilities for the specific reason that they would use them to build up the church, to serve one another, to love one another. And so notice that it's, it's not, he doesn't gift us so that we can build ourselves up, so that we can build up our own platform and, and boast about our own abilities. No, it's for the good of other people. It's for the good of one another. And so we use them to serve one another. And so if we think about that idea, okay, that's kind of the big idea of spiritual gifts, that God gives them to us to build up his church, then there are two things that do not make sense at all when we think about this teaching of spiritual gifts. First, the first thing doesn't make sense biblically is a Christian who is a part of a local church but doesn't serve in any way. That doesn't make sense. This makes no sense according to the teaching of spiritual gifts. And I think this is kind of this modern phenomenon that results from kind of our consumerist society. That kind of, we've kind of turned the church into this, another self-service device where some people approach church asking, what do I get out of this? What do I get from this? And so this idea of spiritual gifts, that tells us that that's the wrong question to ask. The right question is, how can I serve? How can I serve each other? How can I serve one another? Not what do I get out of this? And so that's the first thing that doesn't make sense. The second thing that doesn't make sense then, based just on this teaching of spiritual gifts alone, is, and I think it's another modern trend, is the idea of Christians thinking that you can live out your faith detached from any expression of the local church. That you can just go live this out, and you're like I come to Jesus and I'm going to go just live this out on my own. That I can just practice my faith by myself, isolated from everyone else. This, this New Testament teaching of the spiritual gifts, that kind of obliterates that idea. Because the idea of us giving our gifts is to serve one another. We can't serve one another if we cut ourselves off from one another. And so God intends these gifts as a blessing to each one of us so that we can use them in the lives of one another. That's the practical reason he gives us, so that we might use them in community and in relationship with one another. And so verse 10, again, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards, as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so I want to key in on that phrase, good stewards. Okay, the, the, the phrase God's varied grace, that just simply means the various ways God gifts his people, the different spiritual gifts. Okay, but, but how are we to be good stewards of these spiritual gifts? What does that mean? Well, I want to suggest two things. First, the way to steward your gifts, use them. Use them. That's the most obvious from the passage. You, you're a good steward of your gifts when you use them. So to be a steward means to care for something that really belongs to some, someone else. And they've entrusted you with it to care for it. And that's why verse 10 says pretty directly, whatever your gift is, use it. Go use it. Go serve. So be connected to the local church that you can serve others with your gifts. That's the way we steward. So the way you steward your gifts is to use them. But a common question then that, that'll come up with this is how can we know what ways God has gifted us so that we can use our gifts to serve one another? How do we know? How do you know what your spiritual gifts are? How do you know what ways he's gifted you? Well, many people today have kind of gotten consumed with, have you heard of these like personality tests like uh, en the Enneagram and, and Myers-Briggs and DISC and things like that? Anybody ever taken one of these kind of taught, help you identify your personality? Well, I've done done pretty much every one of those. And I think these things can be helpful to a degree. Like there, there's some use to, in them to a degree. 
They do help you kind of give you a bit of self-awareness, a kind of an understanding of yourself, kind of give you a kind of a baseline of the type of person you're at. But in my view, they also have some pretty considerable drawbacks. I mean, if we take one of these tests and we learn, let's just hypothetically, for example, learn that you're an introvert, then we just think, well, well, that's who I am. I'm an introvert. I never have to put myself out there. Never have to, you know, push myself. I'm an introvert. That's just who I am. I'm just going to live with that way. Or if you're, you know, the opposite of that, if you're kind of discovered through these personality tests, you're kind of this type A driven, you know, extroverted personality, well, then you might think, well, that's just who I am. So I never have to sit down, be quiet and let somebody else talk, you know, uh, ever. You extroverts know, you know what I'm talking about. The introverts are like, yes, yeah, you guys be quiet once in a while. No, but these tests can sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, they can counterproductively keep us from growing in different ways. And I think this reliance on these assessments, like personality assessments, has kind of spilled over into this realm of spiritual gifts too. And so you can go out there and you can find these different tests, these different questionnaires, these different assessments that help you identify your spiritual gifts. You, you, what, you know, what happens is you go through, you answer a whole bunch of questions, and it spits out an answer. These are probably your gifts. Again, not bad to an extent, can help to a degree, but I think there's a danger when we approach trying to discover our spiritual gifts by just relying only on those types of assessments. Because I think once we get in our minds that, like, I have these two or three spiritual gifts, then we just limit ourselves. Like, I'm only going to serve in those ways. I'm only going to do those things. And it can keep us from actually serving. Like if there's actually a need, it can just keep us from serving because well, oh, I'm not really gifted in that, so I don't have to serve in that, that way. And I think that can also be uh, an un- unhelpful narrative for us, especially for younger generations who are kind of trying to learn more about themselves that we have to know our spiritual gifts before we serve in any way. Like we have to do this assessment before that I can be engaged in the church in, in any way. Well, I came across an article this week by a pastor. Uh, his name's Juan Sanchez. He's pastors down in Austin, Texas, and I've I've heard him speak at uh, uh, multiple times at different conferences. Uh, and he had a, this really helpful article uh, that suggested a better approach, a different approach, to help us discern and discover our spiritual gifts. And so, instead of trying to first discover your gifts through an assessment or some test or something like that. He suggests discovering your gifts by actually serving. Serving. Just go and serve. He says, start by praying for eyes to see needs around you. Asking elders, asking pastors, asking you know, people who are well-connected with the church, ask them, what needs do you know about? Where do we need help? What, what needs do you see? And then simply pick a few and begin meeting those needs. And so his starting point isn't an assessment. His starting point is just serving. Just find needs and find ways to serve. And then as you do those things, be mindful of the things that you enjoy. Be mindful of the things that you're good at. Be mindful of the ways that you get helpful and constructive feedback from maybe pastors or or elders or other people that you're serving with. That may might confirm that you are, in fact, gifted in, in those ways. But his point is, start by serving. I remember several years ago when we were living and we were worshiping in Wilmer, and Marie and I, we had served in several ways. We involved like nursery and kids ministry stuff and, you know, making and bringing people meals. And I had served on a few boards and committees in different ways. And eventually one of our pastors approached me about co-teaching one of our adult Sunday school classes we had at the time. I would never taught an adult class before. And so I was pretty like, no, I yeah, that's not for me. I don't want to do that. And he kind of pushed me into it. Um, and, but over the years, you kind of got re- repeated affirmations from people I was serving with that, yeah, you're, you're doing a good job. Keep doing that. And so it was a, kind of this process of discovery of learning those gifts, finding those gifts, not by an assessment, but just by serving. Just find ways to serve and then continue doing that. And so I discovered those gifts just in that way. Um, and I think that's really helpful for us because I didn't, you know, you don't realize that, you know, I had that those gifts of teaching and and preaching. Finding that, finding that out, kind of realizing that, that doesn't mean then I only do that. It doesn't lock you in like, okay, I now I only teach, I only preach. That means I don't have to practice hospitality. 
That means I don't have to give in any way. I don't have to be generous anyway. Right? I don't have to be compassionate or, or be helpful or do anything like that. No. Yes, you can press into your gifts and learn and grow in your gifts, but that doesn't remove every other possible way of serving one another. That doesn't remove those off the table. And so the point is, is that the, the best way to identify your spiritual gift, just start serving one another. Find ways to serve one another. Focus on serving one another in love first and not so much on discovering your gifts first before you serve. Okay? So don't be afraid of trial and error because it won't really be an error if you're serving the church in love. And so maybe you're wondering right now, so, okay, you say that, Jason, but what are some needs we have? What are some ways we can be serving in the church? And I just want to offer just a few simple suggestions. One is we need to get a more formal greeter ministry with our church going. Our layout of our church does not, it's not compatible for new visitors very well. Our, our, the downstairs kind of being the front primary entrance, but it's kind of a maze to get up here. And so a, a regular greeter ministry at both doors would be incredibly beneficial for us. We had, you know, I mentioned the, sl- the slide earlier about the concession stand. Grab a few friends, go serve at uh, the uh, Western Fest Rodeo in the concession stand uh, a night or two. But we also have opportunities with our, our sound teams, our worship teams, our kids ministry, our hospitality teams, which includes helping with funerals like we saw yesterday, making meals for people. You know, we need people committed to be part of our prayer team, praying with us at our regular prayer meetings on a regular basis. We need everyone willing to give and and express their their generosity. We need people interested in hosting and being trained to lead impact groups. And so these are just a few suggestions. And so the best way to get started in that, let's have a conversation. Grab a hold of me, let's have a conversation and and begin to reach out and see what might be a way that you can begin to meet needs around you. But also, don't just think, you know, the the, kind of the church structure, the church infrastructure. Just think everyday needs that you hear too, right? As As you keep your eyes and your ears open for individual needs, as you hear something, do something, right? As you hear a need, meet a need. And so steward your spiritual gifts well, by using them. And whether or not you actually discover and know specifically what your gift is, just keep serving and loving anyway. It is far better to not know your gifts, but be loving and serving faithfully, than it is to know your gifts and not be serving at all. Okay, So be serving. But the second way that we can be good stewards of our gifts is to remember that the goal of these gifts is not just so we have this highly efficient, well-oiled machine that we call the church. Okay? Efficiency isn't the goal. And so what do I mean by that? Some churches can become so focused on efficiency in terms of policies and procedures, organization, that ultimately it can negatively impact how they go about making decisions, how they go about uh, treating people. And so they make efficiency of the organization the mission. And so when efficiency becomes the primary goal, the institution becomes primary. And when the institution becomes primary, relationships and the good of people, of one another, that inevitably takes a back seat. And you know what else takes a back seat when when people takes a back seat? Our mission. Our mission of making disciples. That then takes a back seat. And so sadly, that's what we've seen happen time and time again, particularly, I mean, kind of a horrific example of this has been the sex uh, sex abuse scandals within the Catholic Church and within other Protestant denominations as well, where the institution becomes the primary thing that has to be protected at all costs, and people get put on the back burner. So we can't see that. We can't have efficiency and the institution become the primary goal. And so God doesn't give us spiritual gifts So that the church, again, will be this super well-oiled machine that puts the business world to shame. No, the goal of spiritual gifts is building one another up in Christ with love so that the world will see how well we love one another. And so this means people, relationships, that needs to be our focus. And when people are the focus, that means we're going to have to approach church with patience. With patience and gentleness. And we have to understand that people most often grow, not immediately, 
but slowly over a long period of time. Okay? And so we shouldn't ignore wanting to have good, effective systems in place. We shouldn't, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be efficient, but they shouldn't be the primary goal. Okay? Systems like that are incredibly important, but only because people are important. Only because people matter. The systems, the institution, that's not what's primary. And so policy, any policy we might have needs to serve our mission of making disciples and loving one another. Pastor John, uh, down at our Granite Falls location, he frequently reminds me that at the end of every decision that we make as leaders is a person. Every decision you make is going to impact a person. And so we need to be aware of that. And so how we arrive at those decisions needs to be done in a way that serves one another and builds one another up in love. And we even see Paul kind of emphasize this in 1 Corinthians 13. And so you have 1 Corinthians 13 right in the middle of two chapters where Paul's describing what the spiritual gifts are for and what limits we need to kind of employ when using certain gifts, particularly tongues. Uh, he inserts a section to remind us that the goal of spiritual gifts is not just efficiency. The goal is love. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, if you utilize all your gifts with just this incredible demonstration of ability and power, but you do it without love, nobody's going to want to listen to you. If you carry out your spiritual gift to the greatest possible extent, but you do it without love, you're nothing and you gain nothing. Those are strong words we need to listen to. And so this is an important reminder for us that, that spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts, are not the mark of maturity in a Christian. Okay, hear me on this. The spiritual gifts are not the mark of a mature Christian. Utilizing your gifts in an incredibly effective way doesn't automatically mean you're a mature Christian. And we can see this so often in pastors and Christian leaders in various capacities that run into moral failures. You know, fall into sexual immorality. They become spiritually and emotionally abusive to their families and their flock. They become selfish and believe the organization of the church exists to build up their platform and popularity instead of understanding that they've been called to equip and build up and serve and love the church. And so their gifts are displayed in powerful ways, you know, great powerful leaders, powerful speakers, but then you see that kind of crumbling behind the scenes. Their their lack of spiritual fruit is slowly becoming increasingly evident to those closest to them. And so this is why the practice of our spiritual gifts in order to serve one another always needs to first be rooted in the fruit of the Spirit. If you're not familiar with what I mean by that when I say that phrase, fruit of the Spirit, this is is what I mean. That phrase comes from the book of Galatians. Paul says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control, against such things, there is no law. Okay, these things are the true evidence that we're growing deeper and becoming a more mature follower of Jesus. It's when other people see these things in us and see them becoming more and more true of us, that's when we're maturing as a follower of Jesus. And so these characteristics, these fruit of the Spirit, coupled with an eager and serious obedience to the commands of Jesus, That's what truly marks a a truly maturing Christian. And so this means who you are, your character, your values, that matters far more to God than your performance or the things that you do. Okay, The kind of person you are matters more to God than the things that you think you'll be able to do for God. And so we need to start there with the fruit of the Spirit in us and root any gifts we have in the fruit of the Spirit first. And so when we think about this question of how do we exercise our spiritual gifts so that we can serve one another and build them up in love, the answer is that we need to be rooted in the fruit of the Spirit. 
And the way we see that fruit increase in us, we see that produced, is through this idea of called abiding. Abiding in Christ. Which is a word that means like remain at home in Him. Stay at home in Christ. And the way we stay at home in Christ is by being rooted in His Word. Being rooted to Him in prayer. Being rooted to Him in worship. Gathering together in worship. Abiding in Him. That's how we see this fruit produced in us. Okay, that's how we need to practice our spiritual gifts in order to be good stewards of them and to serve one another in love. Okay, but again, why? Why? You've got to come back to that why question. Why should we use these gifts to serve one another in love? What ultimately is God's bigger purpose? What's the deeper purpose here in us doing this? Well, the second part of verse 11 gives us the answer. It says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so God's glory is the great purpose of all creation, the great purpose of all who trust in Jesus. It's to proclaim and display God's glory. God's glory animates our lives. And so making God known and seeing him praised in worship is what life is about. That's our great purpose in this world. That's why God created you. That's why he placed you in this exact time and place with the exact gifts that he's given you. And with the exact sphere of influence that he's given you. That's why he's placed the specific people he has around you and put you in the specific relationships that you're in. So that you might help others know and worship God. But what does it mean that God is glorified through Jesus? Particularly in this context where we're talking about a serving one another with gifts. Well, it means that we, when we serve one another, we're loving one another like Jesus loved us. Because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus came to selflessly serve others in the deepest way possible. And so we glorify God when we seek to selflessly love one another by serving one another. And when we do this, our lives then become a reflection of Jesus. And then when we reflect Jesus, that ultimately produces praise. It produces worship. It produces thanksgiving in the hearts, our own hearts and in the hearts of other people. And so it glorifies him when his people live like him, when his people live like Jesus. That's what these one another commands are all about. And so, to close, I can't tell you how grateful I am that this morning, that today is the day that we got to talk about serving one another. Particularly for the, because we got to remember and honor Ivan yesterday. That today is the day that our passage is just God's sovereign in his wisdom. We remember Ivan yesterday and we get to talk about serving today. Because if you knew Ivan, that's who Ivan was. He was a faithful faithful servant. In so many ways, that's how Ivan lived his life. Such a selfless and faithful servant. And so I'm going to miss that example he showed to all of us. But I was so grateful yesterday, seeing so many people in so many ways serving. Serving the body through that funeral. I mean, people parking cars, people, just like Lou wrote in her, thank you. Parking cars, getting the food ready, ushering, all these different different ways. And just being present, praying over the family. It was a beautiful testimony to this idea of serving one another in love. Such a fitting illustration of what that looks like and what this means. And so let's press into this. Let's keep doing it more and more. May we just be stirred up all the more by Ivan's example. Because Ivan's example was a reflection of Jesus' example for us. That's ultimately who he was pointing us to. And so let's, let's be stirred up all the more to love one another well by serving one another.